بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم السلام على خير خلقه أجمعين نبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد Brothers and sisters, Salaamun Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. When you study the biography of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, one thing that of course emerges is the number of battles and expeditions that the Holy Prophet of Islam indeed led and of course was victorious. Many of us would be able to name the likes of Uhud, Badr, Hunayn, Khandaq. These are examples in which the Quran speaks about relating to the confrontation of the Holy Prophet and the Muslims against the non believers. Yet, of course, when you come to Chapter 48 of the Holy Quran, an interesting realization emerges. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna fatahna laka fathan mubina. Chapter 48 was revealed when? The first few verses were revealed after the peace treaty of Hudaybiyah in the year 6 after Hijra, likely in the month of Dal Qa'dah. We are told that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, what does he do? He says to the Holy Prophet that this peace treaty that enabled the religion of Islam to spread and the message of the Holy Prophet to reach people far and wide was the greatest victory. No such description is found for the battles of Uhud, the battle of Badr, Khandaq and Hunayn. Meaning that the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to emphasize an important concept and that is it is not necessarily through a physical or a battle that victory is achieved but rather sometimes it is through peace and you find that this idea is quite clearly established because the Quran says this is a great victory once this was achieved the Holy Prophet وسلم, would send ambassadors and people who would invite people towards the religion of Islam and towards the end of his letter to these kings to these people who are heads of states or nations he would put wassalamu ala man ittaba'a al-huda he would place the ayah in surah taha chapter 20 verse number 47 the final part of this ayah peace be upon the one who follows the guidance it is a promise from god the almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala many a times these letters would say aslim taslam submit and indeed, you will live peacefully. You will go through tranquility. This guarantee encapsulates those people who follow the path of righteousness and the path of guidance. Now, what we find is that it constitutes two essential elements, peace and huda and guidance. The Quran talks about peace, this notion of salam, in many places, of course. One of the exalted attributes of God is peace, as salam. One of the names of Jannah is Dar as salam. The greeting that Muslims are instructed to exchange with each other involves as salam, peace. That emphasis, it's by no means minor but of course quite significant the quran tells us that this peace 
is quite fundamental for the success of the human being. In fact, you only need to look at chapter 16 of the Holy Quran and you'll come across a very important verse that is the subject of much discussion amongst uh, scholars of spirituality and those who present this notion about the emphasis on peace and tranquility within the teachings of the religion of Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in chapter 16 verse number 97 states مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٍ Whomsoever does good and then they are either male or female and at the same time they are believers we will make them live a tranquil, peaceful life. This hayatun tayyibah, what is it? It's, the, it's a beautiful concept in the Holy Quran. In line with many of the uh, uh, concepts that invite people towards peace and submission and the seeking of tranquility. You find that this Hayatu Tayyiba is the real life because the Quran talks about people who are dead and people who are alive. But this is in reference, of course, to their spiritual status. That through belief, through submission to God, through reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the purification of the soul, that is what life in essence is in the Quranic terms. That is what hayat is. That is, there are people who are dead spiritually, but are alive physically. Quranically, that constitutes damnation, that constitutes loss. Whereas those who have discovered the path of God, the path of righteousness, the path of purification, that is indeed life. Hayatun tayyibah can be summarized at this. But also, if we go to the hadith of the Ahl al-Bayt, we find that Imam Ali alayhi salam says or summarizes this notion of hayatun tayyibah by saying it is al-qana'a, it is contentment. Many a times greed, people displaying miserly, uh, tendencies in society drives the actions of human beings. The constant desire to possess, the urge to have and want. One of the scholars say, it is not surprising that we have iMac, an iPhone, an iPad, all that's left is I want, yes? That is quite clearly evident, certainly in materialistic societies, about the acquiring of uh, wealth, acquiring of possessions. And so the Qur'an wants us to reflect upon a very critical realization for the fulfillment of this hayatun tayyibah. And that is what? And that is the feeling of satisfaction with what the individual has been given by the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala and with what they can realistically achieve. Because, of course, there is emphasis upon seeking rizq and working hard, but not placing our entire efforts and focus on achieving materialistic gains. Knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives and takes away, and this is part of tribulation, part of God's plan on this earth, that he gives for some people and he takes away from some people. And the reason why he gives for certain people is because he knows that through giving to these individuals, it is either an examination or is something that keeps them in the right path. Because we have an important narration, a hadith Qudsi, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that amongst my servants, I, there are those who I keep as rich. And there are those who I will keep as poor. Because if I make the rich poor or the poor rich, I will lose them. Lose them means what? That they will turn away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That they will not recognize their potential. They will not develop spiritually. So this Hayat al tayyibah is focused on achieving contentment and understanding that this is a transient, short-term place of existence. And that is, there is, of course, a better, much 
uh, longer, no comparison uh, can be made when it comes to Akhirah. You find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in chapter 4, Surah An-Nisa, uh, ayah number 124, states, Those people who perform righteous deeds and are male or female. Why is this notion of male and female mentioned? Just in case people think that there is some kind of favoritism towards one gender over the other. I mentioned this, I think, in a previous session, that I received once a question from a sister, which was truthful in the sense that she genuinely believed uh, what she was asking. And she said, uh, it was a question through social media, she said, why is it more difficult for females to get to paradise? She actually asked this question. She said, why has Allah made it more difficult for females to get to paradise? It's a wrong notion, of course, wrong understanding. Allah says males, females constantly to remind both that, look, you are also struggling on the same path and the attainment of his mercy, his satisfaction, his blessings is irrespective of people's genders, backgrounds, whatever that they uh, have associated themselves or have come from. Here in Surah An-Nisa, beautifully, Allah says, وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِنَ الصَّالِحَاتِ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى Once again, emphasis, either male or female, وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنْ فَأُولَٰئِكَ يَدْخُلُونَ الْجَنَّةِ They enter paradise. وَلَا يُظْلَمُونَ نَقِيرًا And they will not be oppressed even to the amount of a naqir. What is a naqir? Naqir in Arabic is, if you pick up a, a date, and you open up a date, and you take the date seed, you will see on the date seed um, a small, tiny kind of particle or substance right on the top of the seed, if you pay attention, right? It's very, very small. In Arabic, that's known as naqir. Allah says, if you do good, and our believers, you will enter paradise and he will not oppress you even to the amount that is equal to this naqir. Date was quite prevalent at that time. They would know everything about dates as well. But of course, Quran is very specific and uses these particular terms and expressions to um, uh, present uh, important uh, ideas for people to understand. Allah says in chapter 10, verse number 25, Wallahu yad'u ila daris salam. Allah invites to this garden or this valley of what? Of peace. He himself, of course, is peace. Wallahu alladhi la ilaha illa huwa al malikul quddus as salam. Yet the other part of this ayah is important, and that is guidance. Peace be upon the one who follows the guidance. Wassalamu ala man al huda, as verse 47 states in Surah Taha. Now, I want to draw your attention to this ayah in Surah Yunus, uh, ayah number 35, which uh, also can be placed alongside the verse in question. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, follow guidance, but which guidance? Who is the source of this guidance? In Surah Yunus, verse number 35, Allah says, الحق, It is Allah who is the source of guidance. There are people who say, no, it could be another way in which we attain guidance. The Quran answers them, So, the Quran says, how can you imagine or fathom the notion that there are others who guide to the truth, whereas they themselves need to be guided? So no one can be guided to the truth or the source of guidance except the one who is truth himself. He's the one who guides. You cannot guide to something if you yourself need guidance. You cannot be the source of the guidance, the essence of the guidance. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that these individuals themselves need guidance. Now guidance comes in all kinds of shapes and forms. When the human being is born, it's the human being's ability to latch on their mother's 
Milk is itself guidance. It's direction from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ability to function as a human being in survival, in the fight of, fear, uh, of light mode in, in our lives, to protect ourselves from danger, it's guidance. And it's not only guidance as far as religious direction is concerned. In many parts and ways in our lives. Going back, of course, to <clears throat> Surah Taha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Musa alayhi salam and Harun were to tell Fir'aun the following. First of all, inna rasula rabbik, we are the messengers of your Lord. Secondly, send us Bani Israel because we want to protect them. Thirdly, do not punish them. Fourthly, we have come to you with a sign from our Lord. Yes, this miracle. And finally, there is a warning in verse 48. Inna qad uhiya ilayna anna al-adhaab ala man kathaba wa tawalla. Allah says, go to Fir'aun and says to him five things. The fifth is that note. If you do not, then know there is chastisement and punishment. Question, why should there be? People who have followed, brothers and sisters who have followed, we said the ethos of the Quran is peaceful invitation. Allah says to Musa, Is this somehow different to the message or the ethos of spreading Islam through peace? By saying to people, hold on, if you don't, there is punishment. Does this go outside that kind of uh, uh, understanding? No. Why? Because as human beings, we have been created with the way in which we function by understanding the consequence of our actions. That without knowing what are the repercussions for what we do, we will not necessarily make that active step to either prohibit ourselves or to perform a particular task. Uh, just note in, in any society there are laws and laws stipulate that if you break it, there may be punishment. That punishment must exist for the human being to appreciate and to understand and to be in the state of cognizance that once they overstep the line, they are prone to some kind of penalty, some kind of chastisement. Therefore, the Quran tells us that Musa finally and Harun say to Fir'aun, Inna qad uhiya ilayna. We just want to let you know that we have received revelation from God. It is absolutely truthful. It's not that we are thinking possibly if you don't respond, you will be punished. But also, it is done in a polite way. It is not mentioned that, look, you will be punished. The punishment will come down to whomsoever lies or denies the signs from God and turns away. So it's a very wonderful way of presenting it to Fir'aun. It's not like, look, look, you know, if you don't, this is the consequences. Whomsoever does not respond, then of course, they will face these, uh, this particular consequence. An example is given uh, to illustrate that this is not outside the norms of human behavior. Because people might say, oh, why does the Quran warn people so much and describe Jahannam in such detail? Why is that? Does that somehow not, uh, illustrate uh, the less merciful nature of God? Not at all. An example is if you go to, the, to a doctor, to a physician, and they say to you that, look, if you continue eating your curry and your baklawa and your samosas, you will get a heart attack. You will simply suffer from a heart problem. Is the doctor unjust here? Is the doctor using force or warning which is unacceptable outside you know, human behavior or any merciful nature that we expect from individuals? Not at all. He is putting ourselves in the reality. Now, this is very important and I would like your attention here because there is a haqiqa Qur'aniya, a 
Quranic reality which we need to understand and that is this that we ourselves as human beings are building our own destiny meaning what? On the day of judgment, our actions will be manifested before our own eyes. Manifested in which way? The Quran says to us, That those who usurp, who usurp the wealth of the orphans, that money belongs to orphans, they're actually consuming fire and their bellies are erupting in fire likewise Allah says in uh, chapter 3 verse 30 on that day you'll see things manifested what you have done before our own eyes the concept that has been developed by Islamic theologians over many many years is this known as tajseemul a'mal the manifestations of deeds. This means what? This means whatever you and I do, we will see in a form, in a creation. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make visible for us. It's not that we will only see our books with the books of deed with the description of what is written or necessarily see a video, so to speak, of what we did in this world. But the deed itself will present itself before us. Narration number one, that a believer on, on uh, when their uh, judgment or their accountability ends is taken by a creation of God whom he know, or she notices to be of extreme beauty and takes them towards Jannah. Before entering Jannah, looks around and asks this creation of God, who are you? The response, I am the happiness that you placed in the hearts of your brothers and sisters in dunya and made into a particular creation. Narration number two, the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his progeny, in the journey of Mi'raj, in Jannah, he sees Malaika building what? Building the palaces in Jannah. And they are waiting for the gold bricks. So he asks them, what are you waiting for? They respond, we are waiting for the ammunition, so to speak, for the equipment, not from Wicks or Selco, from this world. Which way? Whoever says the tasbih, subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. Immediately, that gives the malaika, what? More of these kind of materials, so to speak, that they build these palaces for people in general. Of course, the sahaba were very happy when they heard this they said we do tasbih a lot so that means we have a lot of palaces in paradise and the prophet responds to them and saying yes but it, it can also be destroyed through sins just like how it's built through righteous actions and the remembrance of god it can also be removed or annihilated through vices the idea is it is not that Jahannam and Jannah are entities or places that are simply entered by people. But it's more, in addition to this, likely that we are the ones who are creating and are building and are constructing what? Our own outcomes. That's why the hadith says, Adunya mazra'atul akhirah. That this world is a place of harvest in which we plant the seeds and we see the crops on the day of judgment so the reality is this allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to harun uh, musa and harun say to fir'aun it's a natural consequence it follows it comes in line with those who disobey and turn away it happens it's a result just like how righteous deeds result in the construction or in the uh, bounties of God uh, on the day of judgment. Now, the Quran from verse 49 moves into a new phase. This is the completion of the conversation and the dialogue between the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala and Musa alayhi salam. The Quran is very precise. It's concise. 
it does not mention details which are not necessarily for us to know and are not important. So it skips the whole journey of Musa back to Egypt and what happened before he entered the palace of Pharaoh, as well as what they said to Pharaoh, because Allah said to them, say this to Pharaoh. Quran doesn't repeat unnecessarily. We are told in the world of Hadith that Musa met his brother Harun السلام, at the outskirts of Egypt and they moved towards the palace of Fir'aun. Uh, Fir'aun had many palaces, it is uh, narrated. And uh, one narration states that in the palace that uh, he was residing, Musa السلام, who had gone to see Pharaoh, uh, witnessed a number of lions who Pharaoh himself had placed outside the palace as means of protection or, you know, boasting. And as soon as Musa and Harun السلام, was working, walking towards the gate of the palace, these lions sat down and bowed down in respect of these holy individuals. So there was no attacking of them, according to the riwayat. They approached the palace gates and they asked, they said, we want to see Pharaoh. The soldiers looked at them and says, what do you want? Why do you want to see Pharaoh? They responded, we are messengers from God. The narration tells us that the soldiers looked at them. Now here was Musa with his thick clothes, perhaps, you know, just ordinary clothes or, you know, of a shepherd. Yes. And with him, Harun, who is one of the Bani Israel, I'm sure suffering. They looked at them and say, you're working, walking with a stick and you're wearing wool. Couldn't God send a better messenger? Surely someone from God should be better looking, better presentable. This reminds me of the story of Talut in the Quran, in uh, Surah Baqarah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this particular individual who was sent to Bani Israel as a king to lead them against Jalut, Goliath. The story is also found in the Old Testament. Uh, I think in the book of Samuel's. And uh, Talut was a man who was known for his strength. He was quite tall and uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him physical strength. Yet what had happened was Bani Israel who were suffering from various uh, different kings and so on and had their uh, women enslaved and their children taken as captives. They had complained and said, we want a king to fight this uh, unjust leader by the name of uh, Goliath, Jalut. They asked a prophet of God. They said, will God send us a leader? This prophet said, yes, here he is. He introduced Talut to Bani Israel. Now, Bani Israel looked at him, according to the Quran, and immediately rejected him. What was their basis for their rejection? In chapter 2, verse 247, this is what it says. قَالُوا أَنَّا يَكُونُ لَهُ الْمُلْكُ عَلَيْنَا وَنَحْنُ أَحَقُّ بِالْمُلْكِ مِنْ how on earth can he be the king and we are more worthy to be kings than him? Why? He was not given any wealth. We are more wealthy. So the criteria by which they judge representatives from God, people whom God has sent, is what? Worldly. Hold on a minute. If he is king, he needs to be quite wealthy, quite affluent. We are more wealthy than him. How can he be? A man who God has chosen. That's why, you know, people often struggle when it comes to understanding that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam, eight years of age. People said, hold on, how can that be? Eight years and he's an imam whom we should be following? Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace and blessings be upon him. Hold on, there are people older than him. They should be the caliph after the holy prophet. So they look at these criteria which the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala has not even mentioned age or wealth or things like that. Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala says, it's he, me, it's I who chooses who my representatives are. And it's not for people to stipulate and start to make distinctions and reject based on their whims or based on the ideas that they have in their minds. So uh, 
Musa السلام, was then given permission to go into the palace. Now imagine the scenario. Fir'aun knows Musa, but hasn't seen him for 10 years. Now he sees Musa approaching him with his brother Harun. And what goes through the mind of Fir'aun? Can you imagine? This is the man who I was told in my dream might bring my kingdom down and I raised him in my palace. Yes, Quran beautifully tells us of the disappointment of Fir'aun when he saw Musa first. It says to us in Surah Al-Shu'ara, verse number 18, uh, not in this chapter, not in chapter 20, uh, sorry, in chapter 26, verse number 18. قَالَ أَلَمْ نُرَبِّكَ فِيْنَا وَلِيدًا وَلَبِثْتَ فِيْنَا مِنْ عُمْرِكَ سِنِينَ Pharaoh says to Musa, O oh Musa, did I not raise you and you stayed here in the palace so many years? وَفَعَلْتَ فَعَلَتَكَ الَّتِي فَعَلْتَ وَأَنْتَ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ And then you went and did what you did and you're one of the disbelievers. What is Pharaoh referring to? The killing of the Copt. Yes? So Fir'aun immediately wants to seize Musa before Musa says anything. Fir'aun wants to kind of corner him before Musa is able to speak, before Musa is able to present the evidence. Yet, of course, in many parts of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that that didn't faze Musa salam at all. He responded confidently in a steadfast manner, and he said to Fir'aun, what Allah said or, or, or commanded him to say. So both Fir'aun and Harun would speak and would say, we are the messengers of God. We have been sent to you. Fir'aun wanted to distract him. It's tit for tat. Why did you do that? And then all of a sudden, the message is gone. But when there is clear vision, no one is phased. Yes? Sometimes when we are set out to do a particular task, certainly for the sake of Allah, shaitan wants to derail us by making us busy about little things. And today I am saddened that we find ourselves in many places focusing on trivial matters and forgetting more important issues. This is the method of shaitan. Yes? Once in a, a conference this year, I was blessed to be sitting with a few scholars, a few esteemed scholars, including our teachers, some mujtahids, we were sitting on a table eating. One brother took a picture of us eating, yes? And then uh, sent it to me. I placed it on social networking, I placed it on Facebook. Well, I didn't pay much attention. It turns out that when, because we were in this conference, it was in America, they had bought us, you know, Coca-Cola. So Coca-Cola was on the table. Once it was on, the fa on Facebook, note the comments. Oh brother, how can you have Coca-Cola? Astaghfirullah. And then others, subhanAllah, you know what others respond? They say, I'm sure he has a reason. <laughs> he has a reason for what? And I was looking at that and thinking, there are so many problems in the world. And we are now focusing on why he's having Coca-Cola, and number of scholars having Coca-Cola? Now, I'm not going to go into the discussion about Coca-Cola and everything or endorsing or whatever, anything like that. But I gave it as an example of how sometimes we're distracted to look at simple, trivial matters and forget the bigger issues. And that's our problem. And that's satanic. That's shaitan's attempt to derail us from the objectives that we have uh, uh, to establish. Musa is told by Fir'aun. قَالَ فَمَنْ رَبُّكُمَا يَا مُوسَى Notice the arrogance of Fir'aun. Musa initially says, this is your Lord. Fir'aun responds, says, who is your Lord? Doesn't say, who is my Lord? Yes? Who is both your Lords, O Musa? Because in chapter 10, we are given another interesting uh, idea about the um, arrogance of this individual pharaoh when he was drowning notice that even when he was drowning some people say oh you know he 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 sought toba or whatever even though of course that toba is not accepted because he was facing death we are told that his expression demonstrated his arrogance look at chapter 10 verse number 90 Allah says, حَتَّى إِذَا أَدْرَكَهُ الْغَرَقُ 
قال آمنت أنه لا إله إلا الذي آمنت به بنو إسرائيل. Can you imagine? He says when he was driving, when he was uh, drowning, he says I believe in the God that Bani Israel believe in. He doesn't even have the strength to say Allah or I believe in God. To that level of arrogance, he's drowning and he says I believe in that uh, you know that God that Bani Israel believe in. Yeah. And then he says, I submit. But of course, the Quran tells, you, tells him, uh, Allah says to him, now, you, after you have disobeyed and you were of the mischief once, and that's it, you, you know that you're dying, of course, it's not accepted. But it highlights to us this particular individual how his arrogance uh, is, is, is uh, quite clearly demonstrated in the Quran. That reminds me, you know, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in chapter 43, verse 77, that the people of hell will call on the angel of Jahannam. His name is Malik. The verse says, Wanado Ya Malik, the people of Jahannam who are burning, they're saying, Ya Malik, liyaqdi alayna rabbuk. We want your Lord to annihilate us. They're in Jahannam. They can't even say our Lord. They say your Lord. They say, oh Malik, we've had enough. Can your Lord destroy us? We've been punished a lot. We want to be destroyed. We want to die. Can't take it anymore. Yes? But they don't even have that, the, the kind of ability, so to speak, or the humility to say that, oh Lord, our Lord. Yes? And so on. That's why, you know, uh, our fourth Imam, Imam Zayn al-Abidin alayhi salam, beautifully in Dua Abu Hamza Thamani says, Oh Allah, if you place me in Jahannam, that will make your enemies happy. And if you place me in Jannah, that will make your friends happy. And I know you want the pleasure of your friends and not your enemies. But if you do place me in Jahannam and you chain me to the uh, flames and you expose my sins and my shortcomings to the rest of mankind, all that I would do is speak to people about your majesty, your beauty and how much I love you. There's a huge difference when people like that speak about Allah and people who are in Jahannam whom Allah knows are, have reached this level of arrogance and rejection of God's plans. Final point that we'd like to mention is a discussion amongst Mufassireen that why did Fir'aun say here, Qala faman rabbukuma Ya Musa. There is a, there's one of the Mufassireen, his name is Alusi in Ruh al-Ma'ani, the tafsir known as Ruh al-Ma'ani, from our brothers, from the other schools of thought. He claims that Fir'aun believed in a supreme God, but was too arrogant to admit it. And that's why he said to Musa and Harun, exactly who is your Lord? Because he knew about this creator and didn't want to accept it straight away. Others have said no, it is likely that Fir'aun was in line with the belief of many at the time of the Holy Prophet, the Jahiliyyah, and those before them, that there is a God out there, but he is disconnected from creation, and that he has people, or he has certain creations or objects which are gods and should be worshipped on his behalf. So they believed Allah, Al-Uzza, Manat, these kind of idols that they used to worship, are gods as well as the supreme god. But they believe there is this magnificent Lord, but he cannot be worshipped because he is far away or he is not connected to this particular existence. Some say that Fir'aun believed that he is the Lord who is being given the, uh, the responsibility to be the God, so to speak, in his eyes of the creation of the people because the supreme creator is not to be reached. And that's why uh, Fir'aun says, who is your Lord, to try and see if that matches with his understanding of that particular idea. It is possibilities. These are all being presented as possibilities. But of course, as we know, that irrespective of each and every of these theories, it is shirk and polytheism after all. It is concluded as associating others with God and rejecting the one and only creator. 
Insha'Allah, we will discuss ayah number 50 and the essence of the creation of God and guidance, as well as the argument that Fir'aun tried to present before Musa and the people around him and the signs that uh, subsequently followed next week at 7.30 insha'Allah ta'ala wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallillahumma ala sayyidina muhammadin wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin